You guys ready to chop it up? Welcome back. Welcome back. Oh my gosh, you guys, you, know, you already know, I always say it and it is always true. <laughs> Welcome back to Chop It Up. Listen, you guys, today we have, an, um, it's going to be an amazing day. Just, just know that it's going to be an amazing day. We have an incredible person in our midst. But before we introduce our special guest speaker uh, tonight, today, we want to thank everyone for their support uh, of this channel. You guys, I wanna thank you for subscribing. I wanna thank you for liking the content and really engaging with the content. It's a lot of work, as you guys know, anything that you're passionate about that you put uh, and that you share with the universe. So I just wanna thank everyone for truly supporting us. Um, and as you know, Chop It Up, the Chop It Up podcast is a grassroots series. It's designed to empower, to inspire, and really elevate the consciousness. Each week we have high value individuals uh, having conversations on business, on lifestyle, things that really relate and resonate with our community. So again, I wanna thank you guys for your, uh, for your support, certainly. And today, oh my gosh, you guys, today, it is no exception. I wanna introduce you all to an amazing uh, person that I admire. You guys, just listen to the bio, okay? Let's get into the bio. Okay, so, one second, you guys. Let me get that bio up. Anton Gunn is a former senior advisor to President Barack Obama. Can, can, can we get some bomb drops in here? Oh my God. You guys, yes, I told you, high valued. <laughs> okay, you guys, I digress. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> um, he's a former senior advisor to President Barack Obama and the world's leading authority on socially conscious leadership. He has a master's degree in social work from UCF, USC and was a resident fellow at Harvard. He is the best-selling author of The Presidential Principles and has been featured in Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, BBC, NPR, and so on, such as Good Morning America. Anton Gunn is an international speaker and a consultant. He has worked with organizations such as Microsoft, Verizon Wireless, Aetna, and, and a slew of wonderful companies. He is a, a person, people. I just found out you guys, he's a hip hop head. <laughs> so that is awesome. He's not all corporate, you guys. He's not all corporate. <laughs> Mr. Gunn, welcome to Chop It Up. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. I need you to, I need to take you everywhere I go and have you read my introduction everywhere else because you, you made it sound so good, but I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, it's an honor. As, as I said, um, in terms of what we do here at Chop It Up, really speaking to people like yourself that are so positive and that can really leave an imprint on people like myself and people within the community and really elevated, like you said, in terms of the consciousness. Um, and I really am so excited to talk to you. So thank you again for your time. You guys, let me just say, it was so hard getting him. <laughs> it was so hard. But I have to publicly say, you have an amazing team. Thank you. I just want to let, yes. you have. So they need a raise. <laughs> yes. They need a raise. Yes. Regina, thank you so much for your help with organizing and facilitating this conversation. So Mr. Gunn, you ready to chop it up? Let's do it. Let's chop it up. Let's go. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So firstly, 
I wanted to ask you about leadership because one thing I saw that resonates throughout your personal brand uh, is leadership. You speak a lot about leadership and that's big now, especially coming out of the pandemic. I feel like we're still in it, in it. <laughs> but um, you know, when the pandemic really started, which was, I'm in New York, where are you? I'm in South Carolina. Oh, awesome, awesome. So during the, the height of the pandemic, uh, many New Yorkers, because as you would have seen on the news that we were heavily impacted uh, last year, we looked towards our leaders. Like literally everyone had to stay home. You had those stay home orders and you had to turn on the TV and listen to at the time, Governor Cuomo mm -hmm. and all our elected officials really leading us through what's mm -hmm. going on, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, around the, the entire United States, we had from the top leader who was very interesting at the time <laughs> to your local municipality. So I wanted to ask you, leadership, how imperative it is? Uh, leadership, I, you know, I have this, this quote that I repeat and it came from John C. Maxwell, who's a great leadership author. He says, everything rises and falls on leadership. That if your leadership is strong, then the greatness will rise. If your leadership is weak, your organization will fall. So it, it matters. Leadership matters more than anything else. Now, before your listeners get caught up and thinking it's just about the politicians or the business leaders who should be good at leaders, I want you to know everybody is a leader to someone you might just have to lead yourself first and foremost, whether you get up out of the bed, whether you go look for that opportunity, whether you, you know, feed your, your face that day, you might have to lead yourself or you might lead your family. You might have younger siblings that look up to you. You may have children that look up to you or you might lead in your community, which is how do you take care of your block? How do you take care of your community? Everybody is a leader to someone. And even at work, when if you do customer service work, and uh, you lead those customers every day. So I think leadership is essential. And the challenge is not enough of us think about and talk about the importance of leadership and what is our role as a leader? What is our responsibility? And what does it take to be effective as a leader or be good as a leader? And that's, we all want, because I, I can tell you this, nobody wants to follow bad leadership. Nobody. Uh, I read a statistic in a Harvard Business Review study uh, recently that says 58% of people at work trust a stranger more than they trust their boss. Mm. So I want you to think about that. Wow. People who trust a stranger more than they trust their boss. And so if you got people who showing up to work every day and they don't trust you as a leader, what are you actually doing every day? What, why are you even there? So I think leadership is critical, particularly in the middle of a pandemic where the world is going crazy. We all need to follow good leadership, people who master the values of leadership and who answer a lot of the fundamental questions, which I teach every day in my seminars and also in my keynote speeches. That's amazing. I mean, I can, I can listen to you talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, because... It's so funny because while I was preparing for this um, episode, I wanted to ask that because a lot of time we look up to like the corporate leaders and our politicians, but like you just said, it starts so much on the basic level, on the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing, if we, you know, are being candid because this is chop it up. Mm -hmm. uh, many times within black and brown community, it's the lack of, on a micro level, on a micro level, mm -hmm. there is a lack of leadership or cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. As we think about, you know, what's happening in Haiti right now with the migrants, yes. you know, let's be real. We gotta be real, because, yes. you know, yes. um, and not to get too political or whatever the case may be, but it's that lack of leadership, even on the micro level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of, as you, you, you already know, I think that's one of the downfalls of, a lot of times within um, black and brown communities, as you would concur. So I'll, I'll, I'll add this about that. You know, um, I haven't always been corporate at all uh, and working with big companies, but I actually started my career as a community organizer. Oh. Um, 
Uh, and then most people don't know that, um, you know, but if you know anything about my political background, you know, I started in 1996 knocking on doors in low income public housing projects, asking the folks who live there about how they got treated when they went to the local hospital or health system. And where I live, we found that if you were poor, if you were black, if you spoke a language other than English, when you went to the hospital, you didn't have a good experience. They didn't treat you well at all. And everybody knew it. And I had people who would tell me, don't, if you get sick, don't go over there because they don't like people like us there. And I would ask, how long has this been going on? And somebody said, well, I'm 50. It's been going on my whole life. And I'm like, is nobody going to do anything about it? As people got into the, to the complacency of just accepting the status quo and feeling like that they were powerless to do anything about it. And what I began doing as a, as a teacher, as a leadership development teacher, is teaching people that every one of us has power. Every one of us is a leader. We have to understand what our power is. And the first thing that we have power on is our voice. How do we open our mouth? What do we say? What story do we tell about ourselves in the mirror in the morning? But more importantly, what story do we decide to share with the world? And what I ended up teaching people to do is the first basic of a leadership is to be able to tell your story. Because if you can tell a compelling personal story about your life, where you are, how you got here and what you do, it's what makes you fascinating to people and makes people wanna follow you. Like we don't, we don't follow behind leaders that are not fascinating. And fascination is a word that could be good or could be bad, right? So here's one example. You talked about my work for Barack Obama. People found his story fascinating. A black dude running for president, born in Hawaii, got an African father, a white mother, lived in all of these places, went to Harvard, you know, went to you know, Columbia University. So people were fascinated about Barack Obama. And so if you can capture them being fascinating and you got something to say that matters to them, that is valuable to them, then people will want to stay engaged with you. And so what I tell everybody is, how do you tell your own story that is fascinating, that it interests people to get involved? And so whether you are, I mean, think about anything, the whole Me Too movement, be, be, got built around the fascinating story, the awful experience that someone had, and they shared that experience and they built the whole movement around it. So leadership requires us to tell effective stories, particularly stories about ourselves and what we can do to make change when we want to make change in our communities. Wow, that's beautiful. Wow. I mean, I only think I don't even know what to ask after that one. I don't even know how to follow up. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's, you know, when I was younger, um, if you're being candid, I, so I've always been very ambitious. I think everyone personally who knows me knows I've always been ambitious. So I had an opportunity to travel uh, to a huge convention with thousands of people from all walks of life out in Florida. And I was just mesmerized. Here I am. I think I was maybe 19, 20. Um, yeah, I think I was around that age. And I was so shy. I know. Can you imagine, Mr. Gunn, me being shy? <laughs> I cannot. I was, so <laughs> I was so shy because here I am, a teen trying to figure out life or whatever, what's, what, what I'm going to do after college or whatever. And I'm with all these people that are making money and millions and they speak so well. And at that time, I was a little bit self-conscious about how I spoke. Um, Cause I was teased, you know, when you were, when you're a young girl in high school in the Brooklyn, you know how that goes. People mm -hmm. be trying you, they be trying you, Mr. Gunn. Yes. They try you. And I was teased a lot because I had an accent or whatever the case may be. And I, I kind of like, it kind of made me go inwards. But I remember one young lady and Janelle, if you are listening to this, I wanna thank you. I remember in a hotel room, she said, why? She said, why, why are you scared to speak? She said, that is your superpower. She said, your accent is your superpower. 
your versatility, your presence. And she just spoke into me. And I think after that, I was like, all right, bam, forget it. It's a wrap. But you're so right, because that was my story. You know, you know, the, the, yeah, so you're absolutely right. So I wanted to ask you, what are three things to look for in an effective leader? Or if you're building your brand, what are three effective things? So I would say if you're looking to build a, a brand a, around leadership, um, the, the, the main context of a brand, this is what I teach people, is what do people say about you when you're not in the room? Whatever people say about you when you're not in the room, that is your brand. Because if people are talking negatively about you behind your back, then that means there's something that you're doing that is creating that kind of environment. So what I would encourage everybody to do is that before you try to lead people, you need to learn how to serve them first. So, you know, Dr. King has this great quote that says, anybody can be great because everyone can serve. And the point is, your greatness as a leader is not tied into how smart you are, how much money you got, you know, how you can floss or, or what kind of swag you got, but it's how you decide to make a difference in people's lives, how you show up every day. So if you want to build a great brand as a leader, then find yourself ways to be useful to other people to make a difference to other people, to add value to other people. And when I say make a difference, I'm not saying tell people what they need in life and then you try to fill that need, but it's basically asking people, what do you want? What do you need? What do you need help with? And if they tell you, I need help with X, then you help them with X. Don't try to tell them, well, I don't think you need X. I think you need A, B, and C. They didn't ask you, you know, what, what you think your advice was around what they need, you ask them what they needed help with and you should be willing to help them. So that's the first thing is become a servant first. You learn how to serve people and be consistent at it and don't do it because you're looking for something in return. Like I, there's way too many people who say, you know what, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's not service. That's a transaction. That's a transaction. And the problem is we got too many transactional leaders. We see it in politics all the time. Hey, if you vote for me, I'll give you this. Or if you do this for me, I'll do that. You got to become relational, which is to be intentional and long-term in a relationship with other people. That requires you to serve. The second thing that I tell people to do is you got to learn how to empower people. So if service is the prerequisite of leadership, empowerment is the essence of leadership. Now, what's the difference between service and empowerment? The empowerment side is you got to give people information, tools, and resources that help them to be more successful. So it's the old adage, instead of feeding a man a fish, you got to teach the man to fish. If you really want to become an impactful leader with a monumental brand, you got to find a way to empower people. Give them the information that they need to be successful. Don't tell them that they need to get a college degree. Show them how they can go to college and and afford college and show them what schools will admit them. Give them the book that you use to find the scholarships for you to go to school. Walk them through the financial aid process. Equip them so they can actually get what they want. That's the second thing is you gotta empower people. So the third thing that I'll tell you, if we're talking about a brand, and this is something that's really critical to me, is that you have to find a way to help make things right for people when they go wrong. So when I say make it right, I want you to understand that the world is unfair. We all know this, right? And and we hear that life is unfair all the time. Well, unfairness is something that we all experience and something that we all can't stand. We, we, nobody wants to be treated unfair and we know life is unfair, but your responsibility as a leader is to do something to try to make it a little bit more fair. You may not be able to solve every problem. I mean, you can't eradicate poverty, 
but you can make it a little bit right, more right for one person who's poor. So if you get your mindset to focus on making it right for people, doing something to make it right, that's how you build a brand that people want to follow, that people feel inspired by, that people feel motivated by. And actually, it'll help you get promotions on your job. If you embody these standpoints, it'll help you get new opportunities. You'll grow your business. You'll be better in every way, shape, or form if you just say, you know what? I'm going to serve first before I try to lead. Then I'm going to empower people by giving them the tools and the resources. And when stuff goes wrong for folks, for people, I'm going to do something to make it right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit there and just watch it just be screwed up. I'm not going to sit there and watch it be messed up and say, that's somebody else's job to make it right. Or what can little old me do? I can't do nothing about that. That problem's too big. You got to not make those excuses and say, you know what? I can do something to make it right. Maybe it's write a letter. Maybe it's show up for this rally or this march. Or maybe it's, you know what? I'm going to call my supervisor and get them to do something different. You can do something to make it right. Everybody can do that. That's how you build a brand. You know, I'm so emotional as you're speaking and because, you know, sometimes you don't know, you know, your path in life, right? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you face so many adversities, especially as you're trying to figure things out. Yeah. But as you're speaking, I had to grab a pen. Like, I had to write it down because it's so full circle. Because as you're listening, being a servant, empowering people, making things right, making things go right when they go wrong, not to toot my own horn, but as you're saying those things, I'm listening and I'm like, God, I'm so grateful that I embody those things without knowing it. Like, it's so crazy. Very good. Like right now I'm working on a contract here uh, with the state and there's so many issues, especially in light of the pandemic and people are just complaining and every complaint that I get, even though it's the same complaint and it's mundane, I always try to make it right. Mm -hmm. And and that's just in me. Like, yes. but as you're saying that, I'm like, my God, like sometimes you really can meet people that can speak life into you. Mm -hmm. And I hope you guys, listen, I hope you guys are taking notes just as I am, because what he said is so inspirational, but it's so impactful. Mm -hmm. What is your personal brand? How can you truly, we, a lot of times we play the blame game, mm -hmm. but you now know there are three components to propelling yourself, to increasing your worth. It's about being right and doing right by your fellow man, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And let me Amazing. add one add, add one other thing to this. And I, I don't want nobody listening to just think like um, this is easy because it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. And at any moment in time, we all get into this, you know, circumstance where we don't try to make it right. And, and I, let me frame it up to you this way. Um, the longer you are around something, the more you become aware how messed up it is, you know? So it's like, if I just move to New York City tomorrow, let's just say I move there tomorrow, I'm gonna be amazed by the big buildings. I'm gonna be amazed by all of the people, the great restaurants, the great music scene. I'm gonna I'm love New York City because I just got there that day. I'm gonna think, oh, this is amazing. But if I lived in New York City for 25 or 30 years, all of the tall buildings and the nice restaurants, that's going to wear off real quick. That's I'm right. going to be aware <laughs> of the traffic. I'm going to be aware that trains don't run on time, that the cab drivers won't pick me up, that, you know, I can't have a peace and quiet night because there's always noise or sirens. out. So I'm going to become aware of the problems. You forgot and one so the, more thing. Yeah. You forgot one thing. What's the that? big rat. The, the big rats, that's right, the big rat, right, the big rats. So 
the longer you are around, the more you become aware of the problems. Right. But then that means if you're aware of the problems, you've had time to think about what you can do to make it right. But I'm going to tell you this right now. 95% of us do nothing. Sorry. Now, when I say 95% of us do nothing, let me give you, let me break it down to you in this way. 50% of people don't even know that anything is wrong. These are the people who I, I say they're living in oblivion. Like, you know, it's like that friend you got who is just like happy-go-lucky all the time that they've never seen a problem. Oh, I've never seen a rat. I lived in New York City and I've never seen a rat. Or, you know, every time I go catch a cab, you know, I always get a cab. And the train runs on time for me. So they, they make, they have this oblivious nature that everything is perfect, okay? And so 50% of them, they don't even see what's wrong so they can't do anything about it. So you can't fix what's wrong until you know what's wrong. So that's half of people right there. But then you got 35% of people who are aware that stuff is messed up and have some ability to do something about it, but they don't do anything. Why? Because they make the excuses that I talked about earlier. Well, you know what? That ain't my job. I don't work for the sanitation department. I don't work for the MTA. I can't, I can't do nothing about the trains. Or, you know, I don't, I'm not the mayor. I, what, what can I do about that? that? That's somebody else's job. So they make the excuse that they can't do anything about it. That's 35%. So between the 50% and the 35%, you got 85% of the people who do nothing. But then you got the 10%. These are the people who are at the top of the food chain. They have the greatest awareness of the problem. And they also generally are in the most senior positions to be able to do something about it. But they don't do nothing about it either. You know why? because they have a mistaken belief that they actually benefit from things staying wrong. But that they, they feel like that they're gonna make more money, they got more power, they might benefit socially or politically from stuff staying jacked up. That if I fix this problem, then I'm gonna lose out. So they actually perpetuate the injustices that happen every day because they like, you know, why should I stop making money to fix this problem. And they get off on being on, on top. I mean, I, you, we, before we got on air, you talked about gun violence. Like, listen, you know, I'm a red-blooded American like everybody else. I live in the South. In the South, everybody owns guns. My last name is Gun, right? Okay, <laughs> but, but there's no reason in the world I need a assault rifle with a high capacity magazine. But the gun manufacturers know that because you got politicians who think that guns are out of control, they can charge double, triple, quadruple for those assault weapons. So they're saying, I'm making more money than I ever have made before by manufacturing these assault weapons. So I don't want to change this. I like money. And so they keep manufacturing more and more stuff because they know people in the South who can buy them and get them quickly and easy, gonna buy as many. So they literally say, why would I change the fact that people are dying at the hands of guns unnecessarily? And why should I limit the assault weapons and, and all of this stuff? Because I'm making money because I'm on top. And so you have that small group of people who are in that 10%. I, I sometimes call them, I give them nicknames like Darth Vader and you know Thanos and you know, Magneto, these are the people who like just straight evil because they perpetuate and benefit from the injustices that happen. And so there you have it, 95%, either 50% are living in oblivion, 35% have what I call paralysis by analysis. They see the problem, but they get stuck and don't do anything about it. And then you got the 10% of the people who are objectively oppressive and obstructive to making change. But what I'm trying to develop everybody to be is to be a leader in the 5%. Mm. A leader who's aware of the injustice, who believe that they can do something about it. They serve people, they empower people, and most importantly, 
they do their part to educate that 50% who ain't even aware of what's going on. And then they equipped the 35% with the tools and the information and resources to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And for that 10%, we make them feel very uncomfortable with living in our world. That is what I call a socially conscious leader. That's what I call a person who lives the justice code, the, the justice code, and who works to make it right every day. How do you focus on making it right? Wow, that's some deep stuff. Um, I'm flabbergasted. Is that right. is that still a word? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still a word. And I do get a little deep sometimes. I ain't I ain't esoteric, but uh I get deep because you know I, I think about this stuff all day. I mean, like every day I see something wrong. And, and let me be clear, let me be honest with everybody. We all fall in that bucket. Look, I'm a man in a, in a man's world. So sometimes I'm in the 50% when it comes to issues that happen to women. I don't, there's certain things that I don't see. I'm also a black man and there are things that happen to me that I see acutely that my white friend ain't never seen. Like he didn't know that police violence against black people was a real issue till he saw George Floyd with a knee on his neck for 10 minutes. And I'm like, bro, you've been living in oblivion your whole life. And he was like, I just didn't know. I said, bro, you know how much hip hop we listen to? NWA talked about this in 1988. Right. Brand yeah. Nubian talked about this in 1991. Right. Redman talked about this in 1993. I said, look, this rapper's been rapping about police problems for years. And he was like, yeah, but I thought that those were individual circumstances with them not a systemic problem. So I'm clear that all of us live in oblivion at some point in time. And then sometimes when we're not in oblivion, we see the problem, but we think we're powerless to do anything about it. I've been powerless. Like, here's my example of powerlessness. I got friends who are into climate change, activism, right? And they were like, we got to save the planet. We got to save the planet. And so my boy showed me a picture of like, Mount Kilimanjaro in 1980, and it was full of snow on top of the mountain. But then he showed me a picture in 2010 of Mount Kilimanjaro and all the snow had melted and grass was growing. And that was saying, that was him saying to me that the climate is warming up and that we're killing the planet. And I'm like, so what you want me to do about a mountain that ain't got no snow? What? Is me changing my light bulbs really going to stop a mountain from melting snow? No, I can't do nothing about, you know, global climate change. Ain't nothing I can do. So I've been in the 35% where I knew that there was a problem, but I assumed that there was nothing that I could do about it. But I pray to God every day and I work every day to make sure that I'm never in the 10% where I'm perpetuating injustice. So we all live in oblivion or get paralyzed by what we know and feel like we can't do anything. So it's this it's really that journey that we all got to be on, on what we can do to make it right. Absolutely. And even as you mentioned about global warming, there are things that we can do on a micro level yes. to yes. help the environment out. Yes. So yes. yes. And so um, I needed leaders to equip me. What are those things that I can do on a micro level? Like change my light bulbs, like recycle, like try to reduce my personal carbon footprint and stop leaving five TVs on in my house. Matter of fact, in our, in our home, we we scale down. We only have one TV That's because right. we like, listen, everybody don't need a TV in their room, you know, and, and I'm watching one thing in here and you watching another thing in there. Let's let's figure out how we can reduce our, our use of electricity and our carbon footprint. So there is stuff that we all can do but we just got to get that awareness and we got to have a leader who empowers us on what we can do. Absolutely. I couldn't say it any better. Yes. Well, you know, you got to come back on, right? Like <laughs> you got to come back on. This is too good. This is too good. All right. So let me ask you, I have some questions that I actually um, contrived while I was kind of speaking and looking you up and so forth. Sure. So there is a fun fact, you guys, that I wanted to share with you, Mr. Gunn. He was a college offensive lineman. Um, and later he became a state legislator in South Carolina. 
So I wanted to know, how did you make that transition from football to politics? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I, I played college football at the University of South Carolina, um, go Gamecocks, um, SEC football, big time college football. Um, how I made the transition, um, it wasn't easy. Um, it definitely wasn't easy and I didn't even plan on it. Um, but the lessons that I learned in sports, I think actually carried me. So when you play on the offensive line, you're one of five people. So you're never a, a showboat individual contributor. You work as a, as a unit. And the lesson that I learned that helped me in politics from the offensive line is this. Number one, your job is to make other people look good. So when you play on the offensive line, your job is to make the quarterback look good, the wide receiver look good, the running back look good. They all score the touchdowns. Offensive linemen don't score touchdowns. We just do our job to create the opportunity for other people to be successful. And as a politician, what I learned is my job to make my constituents' lives successful. So I, I just don't worry about trying to get credit. The second thing I learned is that, um, you know, you need other people to be successful, that you can't be successful by yourself. And as an elected official, I learned that it takes a team. Like, you know, city council has to vote together to pass good laws. And the state legislature has to vote together to pass good laws. So for me, it was about really continuing to commit myself to service. And so when I talked earlier about the value of serving people first, I got involved in politics to serve people. Um, to try to make a difference in their lives and to make their lives better. And so it was a long road. It was like maybe a decade before I went from football into politics successfully. Actually, tw 14 years, it took me that long. But um, it was all about trying to make a difference. Awesome. That's amazing. Um, what have you learned during that transition, during that 14 years? Because a lot of times we think that success is in a vacuum. So what have you learned during that time, Ryan? Yeah, you know, uh, the one thing I learned is that um, failure is never failure. Mm. Failure is learning. And if you get your mindset to understand that, you know, you win and you learn. You don't win and lose you win and you learn. And, and, and the people who fail the fastest are the ones who learn the most. And so in those 14 years, I made a lot of mistakes. I failed a lot. As a matter of fact, what I don't tell people a lot, the first time I ran for office, I lost. I got beat. And what I learned in that loss was that I needed to build better relationships with people and that's what's going to help me to be successful. And so I, I learned that you never really lose, you learn. So you sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. And the goal is to learn more than anything else, because that's how you're going to ensure that you win, is because you learn more than anybody else. That's amazing. Yes, and that, that, that's a holistic, you know, mythology to follow. So that's, that's beautiful. All right, so, uh, okay, in your bio, we spoke a little bit about Harvard. You lectured at Harvard University. Tell us a little bit about that uh, experience. Yeah, you know, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just break it down for everybody to understand. I'm not, I, I never saw myself as Harvard material. So let me put it to you this way. When I graduated from high school, I had a 2.3 GPA, okay? I wasn't no... 3.0 B average student, okay? The problem is in high school, I love hip hop and football more than I love my school work. And so right. I didn't really do the work. <laughs> when I got to college and I played football, I, I was, was good enough to get into college. Um, I went to college, I was a B average, B C plus student. I had a 2.8 GPA when I was in college. And uh, it wasn't until I became an adult and went to graduate school that I focused in on the books and I got a, a, a large, you know, 4.0 GPA when I graduated grad school. But the context of Harvard is that they didn't invite me up there because I had good grades. They invited me to lecture at Harvard because of my life experience, mm -hmm. that my service in politics and working for Barack Obama, they wanted the students to hear my story. Ken, what did I say to you earlier about your story? 
that my story was fascinating enough to the powers that be at Harvard that they said our students need to be exposed to his story around leadership and public service and working for Barack Obama on healthcare reform. And that's what got me there is my story and my experience. And I had a wonderful opportunity. I mean, I lectured, you know, every week on a Tuesday at four o'clock to medical school students and to law students and undergraduate students. And I got to meet heads of state. And um, I met, you know, Henry Louis Gates, who is an incredible black scholar. Uh, Shonda Rhimes was there. Oprah Winfrey came up one week. I mean, I, it was like just mind blowing to have that kind of experience to meet and see these incredible people because that's what Harvard is. It's like the brightest and the best of the best show up there. And the one failure that I missed about being at Harvard. Lesson, the one lesson. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's <laughs> one lesson. Thank you for, oh, for catching good. me on that. Um, <laughs> Nas has a fellowship named after him at Harvard University. Most people don't know that. It's the Nasir Jones Fellowship at the Hip Hop Archives. Well, the mistake and the lesson that I learned is that I should have came up to Harvard in the spring and not in the fall because Nas was there in the spring and not the fall. And he's like in my top five of greatest hip hop artists of all time. We and gonna I would, get there. We I, would get love, there. I would love to meet uh, Nasir Jones because I think, you know, his life and his story and just his, his um, legacy is an important one that I connect with. That's amazing. That's, yeah. Well, you know, he from Queens. Yes. He yeah, is. he from Queens, so Queen's we're gonna make Queen. that happen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, that is so beautiful. You know, as we wrap up, um, definitely, what would you leave our audience with? So I, I will leave your audience with, with two things. And these are two very important principles that I live by and I hope everybody lives by. Uh, everybody should spend their entire life figuring out these two things. The first thing is figure out what you're passionate about. Now, when I say passion, what pisses you off, what excites you, what motivates you, what inspires you. I mean, we all got different types of passions. Figure out what you're passionate about. And then once you figure it out, I want you to become an expert in your passion. So. There are four things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about leadership. I'm passionate about healthcare. I'm passionate about hip hop. And I'm passionate about young adults. And so I spent my life becoming an expert on all four of those areas. So I can talk about hip hop for hours. I can talk about leadership for hours. I can talk about healthcare for hours. I can talk about young people and their experience for hours. And so my point is, when you become an expert of what you're passionate about, then people will see you as an expert. And we like to trust people who are experts in things. And that will take you a long way in life if you're an expert. Now, the second thing that you got to figure out in your lifetime is what you're good at. And see, we all are good at something. Everybody is good at something, right? Don't ever believe that you're not good at something. You are naturally good at something. But when you figure out what you're good at, don't just stay good at it, become great at it. Now, when I say become great at it, I mean literally work as hard as possible to become great at what you are good at. Because when you become great at what you're good at, people will pay you whatever you want to be paid because you're the best at what you were good at. Think about the people who are really, really good at singing and then they work to become great at. Those are the ones who get paid to sing in nightclubs. They get paid to make albums and to make records. But there are also people who are good at math and they're good at numbers. And if they work to become great at math and at numbers, they can become a statistician or a scientist or an accountant or something along those lines. 
if you work to become great at it. And so figure out those two. And if you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm. Gems, 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 gems. We need some bombs dropping, man. I'm telling you. You guys, listen, y'all have to pay for this episode, by the way. <laughs> this is a masterclass. Like, this is literally a masterclass. Mr. Gunn, thank you so much you. for your candid conversation. Organic. That's, that's it's, man, it's a beautiful thing. All right, so y'all already heard. Figure out what you're good at. Be passionate. Become an expert. There are so many opportunities that await you when you figure out your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. All right. So let's get back to hip hop a little bit as we close off. You yes. spoke about Nas and I definitely love Nas. Now I must admit I am from New York, so I'm not big on the hip hop scene. I like a good beat. Don't get me, you know, I, I can get down, you know. Wait, 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 but, wait, 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 wait. You can't be from New York and not be big on the hip hop scene. That's okay. sacrilegious. You might as well move to Texas or somewhere if you're going to be like that. Come right. on, man. I mean, I like a good beat. Like when I when you go out with me, Kamisha can hang. <laughs> but you spoke about hip hop, so yes. What are your top five? Who are you? Yeah. Top so, five? Um, so my top five evolves regularly because I, I just love the culture so much. Uh, I'm a timeless hip hop dude. So you know, I was born in 1973. So the birth of hip hop is the same birth year that I have, the same year as Nas. So my top five re reflects that era. But I'm also a lyrical guy, which means I have a strong preference for people who are lyrical, who literally have a body of work of rhyming that is like beyond excellent. So the, the number one on my list of all time greatest MCs is the God MC Rakim. Okay. Um, of everybody know from Airbnb Rakim. You mean, he, he changed the entire nature of hip hop by the way he rhymes. So he's number one. My number two is Nasir Jones. I already talked about that. Um, Nas also is a legend in, in so many different ways. Number three is the teacher, the teacher, KRS-One uh, from Boogie Down Productions. Um, he is uh, a prolific battle MC, and MCs act like they don't know, but KRS will still battle people in 2021 the same way he battled MC Shan in 1986. So don't be afraid of, of, of that, okay? So number four on my list, and this is a personal favorite, and that is Big Daddy Kane, Brooklyn MC. Uh, a lot of people say, why you don't have Jay-Z or Biggie on your top five? I'm because saying. you would not have a Biggie or a Jay-Z if you didn't have Big Daddy Kane first. Right. Big Daddy Kane is the one that brought Jay-Z on stage for the first time to perform for him. And Biggie looked up to, to Big Daddy Kane as an artist in, in Brooklyn. So Big Daddy Kane is number four on my list. And number five on my list is going to become a shock to so many people, but I'm putting him on this list because of his lyrical ability alone and his name is Marshall Mathers, otherwise known as Eminem. Ooh. And he's in my top five just because of his commitment and passion to the culture and the art of MCing. He was a battle MC first. He made albums, and yeah, he made a lot of pop records, but nobody bodies a track the way Eminem bodies a track. You can listen to Nas King Disease 2 and see how Eminem bodied that song EPMD. You can listen to Jay-Z's Renegade and see how Eminem bodied that. So he is a battle rapper. And Busta Rhymes talked about how him and he put him on a track and how they were so competitive in their nature going back trying to outdo each other. And for that alone, he is the essence of an MC to me, which puts him in my top five, period. Wow, that's crazy, man. That's a, that's a good top five. That's a good top five. I'm surprised you don't have Tupac, which we all love and admire. We uh, bust the rhymes, like his lyrical genius, yeah. like he's yeah. crazy on it. Yeah. So yeah. You know, that's good though. Snoop Dogg, I mean, what's up there? Come yeah, on. they they on the list somewhere, like- You won't get jumped. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm definitely gonna get jumped because Tupac is not in my top 25, oh, not in my man, top not, 25. Not, no. Oh no. no. 
gotta um, end this right now. <laughs> um, Pac was good, but again, yeah. if you think about lyricism Lyric, and yeah. the way I laid out five people who got skills, yeah. Pac was was meaningful and impactful, but he wasn't as lyrical as you know a Jay Z or lyrical as a Nas or Rakim or Big Daddy Kane or even Buster, who just like got incredible style and flow. Yes. And so, yeah. you know, so I respect them all. I love the culture. I love all music and, and all artists that came out before 2010. Uh, I don't listen to nothing right. that came out after 2010. Trap music and all yeah, that. Can't, can't yeah, all right. cool, awesome, awesome. I love that. Yeah. All right, so you know what, as we go, we got to talk a little bit about your experience uh, with our dearly beloved president, uh, Barack Obama. How was that? How did that come about in a nutshell? Yeah, so um, so my I'll, I'll tell your listeners this, and this is I'm gonna give you a little research project for your listeners. If you right. Google Anton Gunn, Time Magazine, Barack Obama, put it all together in a, in a, in one one search, and you'll see the Time Magazine article that shows you how I got involved in in Barack Obama's campaign and how I ended up working for him. But what I will tell everybody is there's nothing special about me. I'm just a regular dude from Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's why I grew up um, you know, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. But my tenacity to go after what I believe is important is how I got to Barack Obama. The short story is I called his office 10, 11, or 12 times and kept calling until somebody called me back. And when they finally called me back, I convinced them that they needed to hire me if he wanted to be successful. So mm -hmm. I had to tell a compelling story, but more importantly, I had to be relentless in chasing what I wanted. And I wanted a relationship. It's kind of like you were getting me on this podcast. I know I make it tough for people to get to me because I'm a busy guy. I got lots of organizations that I work with and, and I'm traveling a whole lot. And so I have a process. And a lot of people will quit on the process before Child, they get to their goal. Y'all already know Kamisha wanted to quit. <laughs> right, right. But you didn't quit. And because you didn't quit, you are going to be rewarded for it. And what I tell people is that I didn't quit on trying to get to Barack Obama. And because of it, I was rewarded with an incredible opportunity to serve the 44th president of the United States of America for 41 months and do all kinds of incredible work that is still carrying me to this day because I had that experience. So y'all don't quit. If they tell you no, just say they telling me no now to the information that I'm providing right now, but keep asking and keep asking and keep asking and keep asking. Don't take no for an answer. Oh my God. And on that note, we just wanna thank you so much I am so appreciative of your time and your honesty more than anything. We went a little longer than normally, but I wanted you guys to really listen to this great man. Don't quit. Mr. Gunn, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Thank, thank you. you. I hope that you do come back or chop it up. Thank you. Thank you. It's you been guys, a blessing you, to be with you. Yes. You guys, please like this. Like it, subscribe, share. This is about empowering yourself, empowering your community. Share this episode. Let us know how you guys are loving this. Send us a voice note. You already know how to subscribe. Subscribe on our YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you're watching and listening to this podcast, please leave us a comment, subscribe, and definitely share this episode. Mr. Gunn, it's a pleasure. May God continue to bless you. Thank, Thank you. you.